Hi everyone, I'm Jill. And I'm Alice. And this is Waterfront, Waterfront Wednesdays. Wednesdays, brought to you by Boston, Boston Harbor, Harbor Now. I am obsessed with Chapter 91. It's true, she's obsessed. With Chapter 91, or the Massachusetts Public Waterfront Act. It's definitely something we've brought up before, but this wonky regulation is something we want to explain to you so you understand how public access works on Boston's Harbor. So I get a lot of questions about Chapter 91, and I thought that we could start by doing a little bit of the history of Chapter 91, and then flash forward to how Chapter 91 enabled the creation of the Harbor Walk. Great. Does that mean you're taking us back to the 1600s? You betcha. So you've heard me say that the early colonists came over to the Commonwealth, and they brought this notion of the public trust doctrine, which has roots in ancient Roman law. Yep. And you've taught me that it means that people needed to have fish, fowl, and navigate, or access the air, the water, and the shoreline. Correct. And that's just because the king controlled the forest and the deer. You got it. So the reason that people brought it here was because they were used to using that in England, but at the same time they wanted to accommodate maritime trade. They thought that was how the Commonwealth would survive and thrive. So they have a special version of the colonial ordinances. So what they did was exactly that. They tried to balance the public's interest right with the promotion of maritime commerce. And so they created the Colonial Ordinances of 1647, which basically codified the public trust doctrine and it extended the private ownership rights down to the low water mark. The low water mark. Yeah, Massachusetts was incredibly forward thinking and being the first state to recognize the trust doctrine. But it's also one of the very few that extended the private rights down to the low water mark. Most states only extend the rights to the high water mark. Which is why you can walk along the beach in California, but not necessarily in Massachusetts. That's exactly right. So after this early buzz of the 1600s, we really don't get a whole lot of waves from the public trust doctrine. Waves. Waves. It's really over a hundred years before we hear of it again. A hundred years. And very little changed until some important opinions by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, who complicated things. Correct, because lawyers. Lawyers. So there's a highly controversial case of Boston's waterfront dev, and that was in 1979 that really got a lot of the wheels turning. And after that law court decision was made, the Massachusetts legislature said, hmm, we need to make some important amendments. So that's about 1983, and they changed a doctrine that hadn't been changed since 1866. That's right. So you, out of the 1983 amendments, you get three really important things. First, it minimized a lot of the confusion that the Boston Waterfront case mm -hmm. created. Second, it increased the protection of the public's interest in tidelands. And third, it created new procedural safeguards for the public interest. And after that, there were some more amendments. There were. There was an amendment in 86, in 2000, in 2007, and 2008. But if we were to go into detail about all of these, we would be here for hours. Bringing all of this together, this Chapter 91 law allows Massachusetts to assert what they called its sovereign obligation. Sovereign. That the public interest needed to be regulated. They needed to have final decisions about the development of those tidelands in the Commonwealth all over the state. Correct. And we should mention a very important agency that is tasked with protecting our rights and representing us members of the public in these discussions. And that's MassDEP. Right. And they have two different ways of looking at new development on the waterfront. Right. And this is really a key part of Chapter 91. So whether you're going to build a water-dependent project or a non-water-dependent project makes a very big difference. Right. And if you're building a non-water-dependent project, your threshold for public access is really high to offset the fact that in water-dependent uses, there probably isn't going to be that public access. Bingo. So when a non-water-dependent project applies for a license, there are a set numerical standards that are not really negotiable. They're just part of the process. But then there are portions of Chapter 91 license applications that are more negotiable, that allow for discussions about how much public open space and where the restrooms are going to be and what kind of bike pathways. And the public amenities that we have learned are more common along the waterfront. Right. So the community has a voice in the kinds of public benefits that are created along the waterfront. Right. And that's why it's super important to get involved early on in the process because you know best of, about the public amenities that make the most meaningful change to your waterfront and ultimately make Boston Harbor the welcoming and accessible harbor that it is today. And if I had to pick a public amenity that always just comes to mind for folks, it's the Harbor Walk. Mm -hmm. 
The Harbor Walk is one of those things that planners and advocates thought about so carefully and built into the city's regulations as well that there isn't as much discussion about it. It's assumed that there will be a Harbor Walk in every project that has a non-water dependent use. And it's important that people get involved in these public conversations and talk about not only the Harbor Walk, but what they want from that Harbor Walk and what they want from those other public amenities. And for that, there's a great resource. Right, so CLF recently published the People's Guides to the Public Waterfront Act. Additionally, Boston Harbor now has tried to make it easier for everyone who uses the waterfront to access information about what's available out there. We have. Check out bostonharborwalk.org for a one-stop shop of all the public amenities that you can find along Boston Harbor. So, now that it's getting warmer, you can use the Boston Harbor Walk web tool to look at all the different amenities, whether that's public restrooms, like we've mentioned. There are places where you can pick up your dog poop in a special yep. mitt. There's places with free public Wi-Fi, and my favorite, ferries. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jill Valdez Horwood. I'm Alice Brown. Follow us at Harbor Horwood or at Fairy Fairy. And if you like this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and throw us a like. Or you can comment below. Tell us about how you've used Chapter 91 or the Public Waterfront Act, or give us ideas for future episodes. We'll see you on the Harbor Walk.